Now I've got you in my space. I won't let go of you. Got you shackled in my embrace. I'm latching on to you. Morning, guys. Um, I didn't want to make this video now because I just posted a video and I wanted to give it a chance, give you guys a chance to watch it. But fuck it, you guys can watch both of them. Supposed to do um, a follow up video discussion interview with DJ Smoo today. Um, the plan was to do one, and a lot of people gave positive reviews to the first one, so people asked for a second one. Then we did the second one, and then people asked for a third one, and some people were like, look, please just keep it going. Um, I'm very, very grateful for each and every one of you who's going to watch this, who watched the conversations with me and DJ Smoo, who commented, who said they'd like to see more. And some of you have been watching my stuff and were just commenting and saying, you know, Penal is a great mind. Is like it. <laughs> it truly means a lot to me. Uh, you guys are influences in my life because for the fact that you watch my stuff, share my stuff, um, say such positive things, and buy my books and donate to me, um, it means a lot to me. Uh, so I, I want to thank you very much. But it's raining in Joburg today, so we're probably gonna postpone. Um, I think when we do eventually shoot, uh, I'll let you guys know and then I'll let you know when the video will come out. Someone annoyed me on Twitter this morning and that's specifically why I made this video now. Um, speaking about penalism and how it's a cult, a lot of people put comments over the past couple of days saying uh, it's the end of days. Yo, um, not surprised. I'm not surprised at all. Um, but this comment annoyed me and my initial response, because he said he's a Christian, was so Christianity is superior uh, where your God flooded the whole world when the world wasn't worshipping him anymore. Your God that killed innocent firstborn Egyptian sons. Uh, your God that played a prank Getting, I think it may have been Isaac, to potentially sacrifice his son. You know, your God that created Lucifer, his creation, that today is now the... All the evil in the world is isolated to his creation. You know, so that he's never blamed for any bad. You know, but I was like, look, you can keep your Christianity. I'll, I'll keep penalism and I'll keep finding my people and, and we'll move forward. So I, I got a bit touched and I decided to make this video now. I don't know if it's necessarily him specifically. Andy Lemnitama has a Facebook page. I don't know if it's him. I don't know if it's someone that created a page in his honor. I don't know if it's run by other random people that he's not aware of. But he posted my Twitter post. Uh, about penalism and about me leaving my Zuluness, me leaving um, Christianity. Um, obviously, calling me the names that other people have called me a narcissist. Um, I've lost my mind, uh, misleading people. Um, I've been captured by a white monopoly capital. You know, it was cool to see so many people in the comments defending me, saying, you know, this guy's actually um, got like a lot of great ideas and he, he, he has great thoughts. Um, one of the comments was, you know, Andile, Penol has actually said good things about you and your leadership. And even yesterday, he mentioned you and he didn't say anything bad. <laughs> you know, I, I met Andile, I believe it was last year, we did a conversation on JJ Tabani's show on ENCA. Um, I think we were discussing about land ownership and race in general, you know, Andile's favorite topics. Um, Andile, is an influential leader. He was he joined the EFF with Julius Malima. Their personalities clashed, <laughs> and he left and he built Black First Land First, Black Land First, BLF, whatever it stands for. You know, I think which is a continuation of the PAC's stance on getting our land back. I think I don't know if Isandla Isandla that signifies um too. You know. Um, Carrying on that legacy of, you know, black people need to get their land back. 
Um, I don't have much to say about Andil. I was just mentioning that um, I did post on Twitter and I think I've probably got 450 retweets now. A um, lot of angry comments, a lot of people laughing that I'm crazy. Uh, people not understanding, what do you mean you left Zulu? So now you're not going to speak the language. Um, it was intriguing for me. Um, not surprising, but intriguing. Um, as some of you may know or have an idea, I'm incredibly well read. I've read a lot of books uh, in many different disciplines. Uh, I have read the Bible. Christian Bible. Uh, I've read some scriptures from the Quran. I've watched some interviews that speak about some of the scriptures from the Torah. Um, I've had conversations with people about the writings of Buddha. Um, I've done basic, basic research on the various scriptures and stories of Hinduism, which is the oldest faith in the world. I think it's over 4,000 years old. Um, Christianity and Islam are 1,500 to 2,000 years old. Uh, Judaism, I think, is 2,500 years old. Judaism, Christianity, Islam are all known as Abrahamic faiths. Uh, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. Uh, that song about Father Abraham <laughs> had many sons. How much the school? Or King Solomon. God help. Call me Solomon. Solomon the wise. Uh, we had a lot of wives and was very wealthy. But the Abrahamic religions, faiths, because the core is Abraham. So when they speak about the God of Abraham, they speak about this God. Then Abraham being essentially like the first main prophet and speaker. And then with Abraham came Judaism initially. And the Jewish people believed believed and still believe they are God's chosen people. After Judaism came this rebellious boy. Hey, Jesus Christ. This rebellious boy uh, born of Mary um, and Joseph, born in a manger in Bethlehem, um, who then came and, you know, and he was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm God's son. You know, I'm, 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 I'm the guy. I'm, I'm Neo from the Matrix. And my mom's a virgin, immaculate conception. And um, he went and he became like arguably the biggest influencer of all time. The most documented influencer that has inspired the most songs, artworks, whatever. This Jesus Christ character was traveling around, spreading love, peace, um, wanting people to be happy, wanting people to be fed, wanting people to be healed. An amazing, amazing person. Um, later on, we find out about Prophet Muhammad, uh, who was not God's son or any spiritual what what. Um, Prophet Muhammad just became the per perfect uh, version of what Allah um, would want from people. A lot of people don't know that Allah is not some other God. Allah is uh, Arabic for God. God is an English term. Nkulunkulu or Tiko are Zulu and Kosa terms. So Allah is just another language, but it means God. Allah is not some other type of. <laughs> it's the same person. It's the same uh, higher being. You know, so when people talk about Allah, they speak about the God of Abraham. The Muslims obviously recognize Jesus just as one of the prophets. They recognize him, but they recognize him as one of the prophets and not necessarily as God's son, so to speak. Um, in time, when we get a chance, because I'll have to speak about Penrillism in great detail, a lot of religions have been born. Um, and I'm not speaking just about the Abrahamic ones. I'm not speaking about Hinduism. I'm not speaking about Buddhism. I'm not speaking about Rastafarianism, which is actually a break um, from Christianity, recognizing uh, Haile Selassie as the coming back of Jesus from Ethiopia. Uh, obviously popularly made, I think he was one of the biggest ambassadors, uh, Bob Marley. Haile Selassie was the guy, but Bob Marley was the influencer um, who, you know, when we think Rasta, Rastafari, 
um, job bless. We think of Bob Marley. You know, I think he was a great ambassador. And he, he like Jesus Christ, preached love, uh, peace, um, getting along, um, spreading music. You know, uh, <laughs> Solomon and Abraham had many sons. Bob Marley had many kids from different women. Damien Marley, Junior Kong being one of them that he had with, I think she was Miss, either Miss World or Miss Universe. Damien Marley's mom is a, is a white lady. Obviously, his wife was Rita Marley. Um, and then later on, Lauren Hill, one of the greatest human beings to walk the planet and potentially my greatest female of all time. Lauren Hill had children, I think five children with Rohan Marley, one of Bob Marley's um, sons. Anyways, religion. And I needed to make this video yesterday, but I couldn't because I got sidetracked um, speaking about my meeting with Rob Harrisoff. Uh, what it was about, the idea of being captured, and a couple of other things. Um, Rob is pulling me <laughs> into his circle, capturing me, so to speak. Uh, we'll call it capturing because I think uh, DJ Smoo is capturing me, pulling me into his circle. Uh, a couple of other influential people um, are pulling me into their circles. Um, they believe I have a great mind. Uh, they would like to use my mind, my ideas. They would like me to use my platforms to further their endeavors. Um, one of the things I posted on Twitter as well was, because someone was speaking about, you know, these rich white people have an agenda. And I was like, I fully agree. You know, the rich and the powerful always have agendas and they look for influential mouthpieces and platforms to push their agendas. You know, um, and for me, I'm fully aware of that. But the key is for me to figure out how can I align my agenda with their agenda so that we can win. So, for example, if Rob Harsoff wants to lower crime, I'd love to lower crime. So if he has certain ideas that I think make sense, I'm willing to punt those here. And if someone says, yeah, but Rob said this, I'll be like, yeah, it's because I agree. You know, Rob said Fili Mbalula is an idiot. He said it, it's popular. He's popularly quoted for it now. But many of us for years have been saying people like Ombalula are idiots. Upegitele during this COVID thing has been bullying poor black people. We saw the videos where when it's white people breaking regulation is soft and tender. And when it's black people, you know, the abuse was, was pathetic. Absolutely pathetic. The way he speaks down on, on poor black people, shouting at them that they must go into their homes and sleep. Is very disgusting. You know, we've got people like Cyril Ramaphosa who I really don't like. I think he's got no spine. I think he's meant to be a puppet for his funders, but I think he's doing such a crap job because he doesn't have a standpoint. At least if we knew Cyril is captured and he works for white interests, we'd be like, okay, I can respect that he's got a standpoint. But he's wishy-washy. Where does he really stand on Jacob Zuma being arrested? Ah, he's shocked. Where does he really stand on... Ace Mahashule being arrested or having a case. Ah, oh, he's shocked. He seems to not really know what's going on. On top of that, he's never been willing to take questions from us, especially during COVID lockdown. So that was very upsetting for me. Um, and to this day, um, a lot of our rights have been violated in many various ways, but it's not important. So I'm happy to push their agendas. And one of the tweets I posted this morning was, as long as poor people... I'm including black and white. As long as poor people do not have values and do not have a vision for their lives, they will go with any loud mouth that cracks jokes. Oh, that guy's so far. Oh, Malima. Mm. Kiss, kiss the poor. What do you mean kiss, Mr. Mali? Mm. Then we laugh. Any loud mouth, funny, Jacob Zuma dancing uh, person who seems to say the right things. Hey, but wait, me just told him to stop it. I mean, but I told him to stop it. So fun. The foreigners must go. The foreigners must go. The guys get overexcited. Um, you will constantly ride whatever trend because you don't have your own values and your own vision. Killer Mike, Candace Owens in America have spoken very much about before you go vote. Have a list of demands. Not for black people. For yourself. For your family. For your community. What do you guys want? We want to fix the potholes. We want better security. We want alcohol and drugs out of our township. 
we would like jobs in these specific companies or in these specific sectors. We would like business funding. And be very clear and hold these people to account. And hold your ward council. A lot of you don't know who your ward councillor is. Hold them to account and have meetings with them once a month. What have you done, Prude? Sister, what are you doing for our people? Why do we still have potholes? Find out who your, your mayors are, who the MECs in your areas are, and hold them to account. Find out where they live and go camp outside their homes and be like, we voted for you. You need to serve us. We have an agenda. Not wishy-washy, yeah, what black people need and what art and foreigners, when it's not really your agenda. You'll just jump on whatever's cool. Anyways, so I think it's very important that people have their own agenda. Um, so when uh, Rob Arasov, when uh, Patrice Mutsipe, when uh, DJ Smu, um, when anyone is trying to befriend you and bring you into their circle and get you to be a mouthpiece and a servant for their agenda, make sure that you know what your agenda is. And you're willing to work with them so long as your agenda is also being met. That's very, very important. Sadly, for a lot of our politicians, their agenda is just making money. You give a politician money and they're done. You can, they can do the most vile shit. You know, they can oppress the worst people. They can get people killed all for money. It's not a sustainable agenda and it's very sad. Back to penalism. I've read a lot of books. I've watched a lot of documentaries. Um, besides reading the Bible, I've read... The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins, who at some point was called one of the most intelligent people on the planet, along with guys like Noam Chomsky. Um, I've watched Wild Wild Country on Netflix about Osho, a cult leader in America, but I believe he was from India. Um, there's a great episode on Netflix explained, speaking about cults, uh, which is pretty cool if you ever check it out. I've done a bit of research on um, Father Divine, um, Jonestown, Jim Jones. Jim Jones was a cult leader in America. Um, I've, I've studied the story of Isaiah Shembe in South Africa. Bit of research on the Lichanyane family. I'm honored to have met one of the sons, great gent. Um, I don't know much about the Mudise family. I think they under the Pentecostal church. I could be wrong. Uh, obviously, uh, Major Wan. Papa, <laughs> Bushiri, uh, has been a great person to study as well. Um, and then obviously I've studied Buddha. Um, I've studied the story of Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad, um, some other leaders around the world. And I'm a huge fan of studying leadership. Um, Vladimir Putin now, Adolf Hitler, King Leopold of Belgium, Shaga Zulu, Robert Mugabe, Donald Trump. Barack Obama, Nelson Mandela, Kwame Nkrumah, um, Good Luck Jonathan, um, Xi Jinping, Kim Jong-un. Um, I'm a huge fan of leadership in all its various forms. I mean, Michael Jackson, Beyonce, you know, the ability to influence people and get them to act in a certain way, like Rihanna. Ngenehe Salonu, Tsingeli is Rihanna, and Miss Kerry Hilsin. You know, that's someone who has influenced your life in a real way. The way you dress, the food that you eat, Dr. CB, uh, alkaline diets and plant-based, you know. Um, read One of the most powerful books you'll ever read is 1984 by George Orwell, which speaks about the Soviet Union. But more than anything, it's, it's, a, it's a book on propaganda, on how the people in power can create fictional enemies for you, um, how they can lie, how they can edit and manipulate history such that if Nelson Mandela was a hero in 94, you might find in 2024 that all of a sudden there are books on how Nelson Mandela was a villain and a sellout and he was never in prison. Like the human mind can be convinced and especially through things like books. You know, um, I learned that books are very powerful and someone will be like, yeah, but I read it in this book. <laughs> and I'd be like, so if I write a book, that means now it's a fact. No. And if you convince enough people in a group that COVID is real, COVID is not real. If you get enough people to sing the same song, all of a sudden it becomes fact. Because like dog, but everyone knows. Everyone knows it's a fact. And I'm like, but it's not. You know, um, studying propaganda. There's a lot of very intelligent YouTube uh, videos on how the mind works, psychology. 
um, the power to influence various colors. In certain countries, red is the color of danger. In other countries, red is the color of love. Uh, in other countries, red is just signifies blood, you know. You might find that certain music in a certain country is played at funerals. Meanwhile, similar melodies are played at weddings. You know, um, things like language. I studied language in depth because I do believe language is the biggest form of propaganda and mind control. You listening to me now speaking these words of English means that I'm influencing your mind in some way. You know, and if I crack a joke speaking this English, you laugh. Your body reacts and you laugh. If I say something inflammatory like, oh my gosh, black people are so thick and so stupid. I elicit an emotion just with language. Merely with words. Merely with the alphabet put together. And part of my journey in my life has been uncovering as many answers to as many questions as possible. I did the religion thing in varsity where I unpacked religion and what it means. Um, I've unpacked politics and what politics means. Leadership, like I said. Basic things like music, diet. A lot of us are now conscious on what we're eating. What exactly are we eating? What happens when you put a seed in the ground and a tree comes out that uh, produces peaches every year? You know, studying things like parenting. Are we parenting correctly? Why must we treat our children like toys, like a Barbie doll, and buy them the latest gadgets? You know, and fuss over them. Why are they not just an extension of us? And who is us? Identity crisis. What does it mean to be a black African in 2022? Does it mean I'm some name come? Or does it just mean I'm just dark skinned? But I'm, for all intents and purposes, I'm, I'm a dark skinned white person, a dark skinned European who speaks English, who dresses Western, who has ambitions to make it in the Western monetary system, economic system, and who follows Western laws and who abides by the United Nations guiding principles. You know, does it, does it just mean that I'm dark skinned? You know, what's racism? What's sexism? Uh, what's gender? I speak a lot about transgenders and gender fluidity. Uh, am I a man because I have a penis? Am I a man because I have a high level of tested testosterone? Am I a man because I, I can speak in a deeper voice? Or because I have more hair on my face? Am I, am I a man because I'm expected to do certain things that I may not be fully comfortable with? And is it possible for me to convert from being a man to a woman? Did Michael Jackson convert from being black to being white because of plexic surgery and bleaching? Um, these are the fundamental questions my brain entertains or has been entertaining probably since I was born. Um, I got to realize that I'm quantified and as something like a philosopher, you know, seeking answers to life. Is the glass half empty or half full? In doing that, um, I've found a lot of key pieces to puzzles that I've been building over the years of trying to understand existentialism. Why are we here? Where are we going? What is our purpose? Why must I vote? What is a president? Why is Prince Harry and Prince William more in important than me? Why is Mrs. Zulu and Asmagate, why do they get to run and influence Zulu people? You know, why is Kaspar Vest so loved? Why does he have a million followers on Facebook, but I only have 92,000? Um, what makes Julius Malima unique versus Malusi Kikaba or Floyd Shibambu? You know, what, who decides that uh, Queen Nefertiti, uh, Cleopatra, that they are pretty? That a, a sharp nose is prettier than a, than a, a rounder nose? You know, who, who says that dreadlocks are cool? You know, those things. One of the pieces of the puzzles which I speak about very fondly is... Um, a TED talk by Yuval Noah Harari, an Israeli man who wrote the book Sapiens, documenting the history of humanity. Um, one of the things, one of the principles in penalism is lies and truth. And it goes that anything can be a lie, anything can be a truth. It depends on your desire to believe the person or the source that's giving you that information. So, there's various tools to get people to believe you. I can be loud, so loud that that's all you hear. So on media platforms, in music, you hear that money makes the world go round. All you need is love. And you hear it so loudly 
that the guys are like, no, but love is not really real and love is a mental illness and money is actually a human construct. Like, that's so soft that you don't hear it. So noise is one of the ways to convince people that it's truth. Convincing influential people um, or people that have been deemed influential. So if I got the Pope, if I got Cyril, if I got Joe Biden, even if I got Vladimir Putin to stand on platforms and recognize me as God Penwell, and so says, you know, I had the pleasure of meeting God, uh, Penwell. If Vladimir Putin says, we now have a new God called Penwell. Just with those few people, I influence so many because people trust them. You know, if I'm captured in a certain science book, in a certain history book, in a certain textbook, all of a sudden people believe it's a fact. And then telling story is the key because it's all about story. If I tell you a story of how I can trace my lineage all back to Jesus Christ, you know, and I tell such a compelling story and I'm like my grandfather and, you know, my family actually moved at like 50 generations ago. We actually were in the Middle East uh, by Nazareth. If you look at my name, Penwell, it's actually from Hebrew and it means the face of God. And before my mom even knew it, this name came to her in a dream, just like um, Mary's conception came to her. Um, falling pregnant with Jesus unawares, this name panel came to my mom. She wasn't a theology student. She wasn't big on the church, but panel came and it was a message directly from the universe saying, please give birth to God. My name is Hebrew and it means the face of God. You know, you can go, you can go Google that, you know, lies and truth. Yuval Noah Harari speaks about objective and fictional reality. How human beings have created a fictional reality that other animals don't buy into. Concepts like money, religion, gods, laws. Other animals don't buy into that. You can go to a dog and be like, Yo, God says you must stop barking. <laughs> the dog will be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, if you go to a monkey and you're like, Yo, but Roman Dutch law doesn't endorse that. The United Nations says you guys mustn't steal bananas. Monkey will be like, <laughs> And go steal the bananas, you know. Um, Yuval Noah Harari makes the example of money and saying that a chimpanzee might be willing to give you a banana in exchange for a coconut, which is bartering, a system we used to use. But if you try to give a chimpanzee, a, let's call it a dollar bill or a hundred rand note for a banana. <laughs> and you're like, no, but this hundred rand note, you can buy lots of bananas. The chimpanzee will be like, I'm not a fucking idiot. It's a piece of paper, bro. Nah. So human beings have the ability to, with language, create stories that condition human minds to behave in a particular manner and to have certain beliefs. So I had a meme on my phone for many years, quoted Adolf Hitler saying, tell a lie, keep it simple, but repeat it over and over until people believe it to be true. Um... And I've been wanting to be a leader for a while because I think I have good ideas for the world. Um, I think I have good ideas for people. And after hearing that, I decided in 2017 to start a social experiment. And in my social experiment, I was going to become the king and get as many people as possible to hear the story of a panel is the king and see how many of them obviously laugh initially and then buy into it and then they start uh, introducing me as this is Penel the King. And I wanted to be like, what king could I be? Because I didn't want to go into politics. I don't like the idea of campaigning every five years and trying to convince people to vote for me. Um, business is very difficult. And I don't know if I really, really like the power that business people have. It's very influential, but I like being seen. Um, I don't like just pulling strings from the back, like billionaires who build these institutions and these systems. So I settled on a king because a king generally is a king forever. Uzueli Tini was king till he died. I, I wanted to become the king of the Zulus back in the day. Um, and I spoke to Ubabu Ngwenya, Judge Jerome Ngwenya, who is the um, main trustee, I believe, of Ingonyama Trust and who was one of the key advisors to Uzueli Um He's my neighbor back in Newcastle. Um, I used to play rugby and I was good friends with his son. Um... So I used to have great conversations with him. Very intelligent, very wise uh, uh, old man. Um, can document, like he remembers history to the T. He'll tell you the day, 
the date, what was happening, you know, very intelligent, you know. So we had these conversations uh, with him. And I asked him, what would it take for me to become the king of the Zulus? You know, we no longer fight, even though Russia is bringing old school back, conquering nations, bringing it old school, boy. So do I build my own army and then challenge the Zulu army? And if I beat the Zulu army, then I can take over the Zulu kingdom. Um, and if I do take over the Zulu kingdom, will it still be called the Zulu kingdom or can I call it a new name? You know, um, or do I maybe challenge Uzwelitini himself to a one-on-one? Shaiku, Baba, me and you outside now. Whoever wins gets the kingdom. Um, do I do it intelligently like Facebook where I build a, a platform and on that platform, I call it maybe Zulu.com. And all Zulu people's data gets uploaded on there. Not through my collection, but through Zulu people choosing, like Facebook, to create these profiles and upload. And on there, you'll ask Zitini's Tagazelos again, your clan names. And you'll punch them in. And then when you compare Bonk Omlojo, we begin building this model of this is actually the Mlojo Watwat. Google and Facebook and some of the greatest technology companies, they don't, they don't create data. You give them the data. They just create a platform. They try to make it cool. And then you come and you give them all the information. And then they work with that. And then once I have all that information, and you upload this every day, all the 18 million Zulu people constantly on this platform, then I create this library. And then once I have the platform, then I start dictating to the nation out there that, no, you're not, you're not real. We can't link you to someone. No, you're not following protocol. And then over time, begin shifting to a point where I shift the minds to say, who's really is not really your king. I can trace it back. And it's not actually, someone lied. One of the women lied. And, you know, this was not really the father. Actually, who should have been the, the king is, and then I present myself. You know, like this battle that's happening now with Usmagate no Misuzul. Usmagate being, I believe, the firstborn son of Uzwelitini's first wife. Umisu Zulu being the firstborn son of his wife who was from Eswatin. Uh, Queen Nfombi. Nfombi, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. But Nesu Zulu Nabesi Tundombi. Wagajamin. You know, who was given this title, which didn't make sense. Why her? Because I think she was the third third wife. You know, but she was given this title and when Uzueli Tini passed away, she then took over. Um, but I wanted to figure out how do I become king of the Zulus? And I was like, you know what? It seems like a lot of work. Amakos, I have their various kings. Amandebele, I have kings. Uh, I was like, what if I became like higher and became king of the Nguni people? And then Kosas, Zulus, Debele, Swatis all report to me. So for a couple of years, I posted stuff on Facebook. And obviously, it started off as a joke. Uh, king Penwell, uh, King King Penwell of the Nguni people, the 27 million Nguni people. And I'd post this regularly and my friends, when they'd meet, they'd be like, oh, king of the Ngunis, you know. And when I was added in a group uh, with some of our influential politicians, one of the jokes there was like, hey, apparently this guy is king of the Ngunis. And some of the people would DM me and be like, you know, where's your palace? You know, um, which land do you preside over? And I was like, shit, people are actually genuinely believing this shit, you know. And, you know, I, I let it go for a while. It was cool. Um, then... Later on, it, it transcended. I was like, I don't like this king thing because kings still have to report to someone. And in studying mind control, which is actually my goal, I've said this before, my goal is to unplug people from the current owners of your minds, um, mental liberation. Uh, emancipate from, what's in Bob Mali? From mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. Um, redemption song. Emancipate from mental slavery. I wanted to emance people from mental slavery, but then I wanted people to plug into me and I wanted to control the human minds and create the fictional realities that they have uh, of what is a God? Who, 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 what is this language? What does history say? Is COVID real or not? And when I speak, people will believe me. It's cult worship, of course, per definition, because English has all these definitions. Um, I could have gone the religious route because I was like, look, I can go the money route, but money 
keeps moving and you can be Robert Mugabe and then the West can decide to sanction your country and devalue your currency. Um, I could be a religious leader, but then I have to, like Joshua Maponga, who had to fight the Seventh Day Adventist Committee at the top above him when he started speaking about African spirituality. And he eventually, I don't know if he's been suspended or kicked out of the church. And I'm like, so I now constantly have to bow down to someone else. Should I be a prophet like Muhammad, like Jesus, like Buddha? And to, you know, there's a new prophet, Pimel, who says he is the voice. He represents God. Guys, God says you guys must do this. I get these visions. I get these visions in my head. You know, do I become a, create my own church like an Isaiah Shembe, which is a fusion. The Shembe church is a fusion of Christianity and African spirituality. So do I create something a bit more modern? And I was like, but all these guys still have to feed back, feed up to some God out there somewhere. And I was like, I personally don't know anyone who's ever said, I want to be God. And that would be like the ultimate uh, source of belief, of thought. Um, so I was like, no, let me try it out. So maybe about three years ago now, I started this social experiment of, let me call myself God. Um, so I graduated from King to God. Come on. Levels, mchana, levels, mchana, come on. So I became God and obviously you post the stuff and it upsets a lot of people. Um, and I understand. And it's been cool getting some people to not really believe that I'm God, but to just acknowledge that, look, you call yourself God. Why can't you be? Because Christians told us that that's their gods, you know, the God of Abraham. So why can't you be God as well? Do your thing, homie. So... I wanted to create this video to just try and unpack penalism and God. Not penalism per se, but this concept of me being God. So human beings, like all other animals, are just animals. Um, after being animals, you almost imagine a naked computer or a naked phone. From there, people start implanting apps, software, an operating system onto this computer, onto this phone. And that operating system and those apps begin choosing, like, what is your language choice? So if you're born in China, you don't choose when you're young. That, mm, what are the options? Mm, let me pick English. No, you, you have to, you, you're forced to speak Mandarin from at home. The first influences are your parents. So you, you get given this language option, which you didn't choose. So you speak Mandarin. If you're born in South Africa, based on the tribe you come from, you implanted it, maybe the Zulu language, you know. So you're like, oh, I'm Zulu. Not because I chose it, but this is the operating system that I got at birth. Along with language is diet. Your parents will feed you whatever's in your diet. So if your family eats sushi, if your family eats pasta, if your family eats upu utu, if your family eats rice, that's what you're going to grow up eating. That's going to be your staple diet and what's going to inform how your body is built up. In terms of what you consume. So the diet is also picked for you. On the operating system. Um, part of what's Im implemented is your belief system. So if you're born in the Middle East. You're going to be implanted with Islam. You don't choose. You don't like as a three year old child. Say, mm, what are the options? Christianity, Buddhism. Let me see. What am I going to order today? Come on. No. You're, you're literally told. We are an Islamic family. You're. Parents take you to madrasa, they, you go to mosque, um, and you have to believe in Allah. And if you're Christian, you have to pray from a young, God bless our food, amen. Before you even know it, you're being conditioned. From this blank canvas that you are, all these layers are added on, um, including dress, what you wear. So that's Jesus, of course, and the boys wore these long dresses. <laughs> Uh, these tunic things that they wore. Today, we obviously dress European or what we call Western European. T-shirts, jeans, collared shirts, you know, jackets, suits. We wear a tie, you know, so it, it informs our attire as well, how we dress. Um, then comes softer things like, and I guess this also ties into your beliefs. What is right and wrong? You know, um, is it right to kill someone? And if you are raised to believe that it's wrong, you will go around the whole world saying, 
killing people is wrong. How do you know? But everyone knows where I come from. This is illegal. You go back a couple of years, and I guess with Putin and those guys now, where they're like, no, but we're willing to kill for land. We're willing to kill. If you swear at my mom or if you threaten my family, I can kill you. You know, one of, one of the principles of penalism is that murder can be valid. One of them being self-defense, of course. You should never be like, no, killing is always wrong. No. If you're about to be killed and your people are about to be killed, you can kill back. You know, we obviously kill animals for food. But again, these nuanced beliefs are based on the, soft, the software that has been put into you. And a lot of people are like, no, but it's your genes, it's your DNA. That's bullshit. That's utter, utter bullshit. So I'll address the Zulu thing first. Zulu is the name of a nation. A, it's a name of a nation. The Zulu nation. Ushaga could have decided when he became king to change it from being the Zulu nation, the people of the skies, the people of the heavens, and called it the Shaga nation. We would all be known as Abantuba Shaga. We would be the Shaga people and maybe the language is Shaga. Oh, now Kulumi Shaga. I'm in Kulumi Shaga. I'm free It's a name. It's an identifier for a nation of people. What is unique about these people? Number one, they're dark skinned. Number two, there's a certain makeup of how they look. And this one's controversial because I believe that if you can see a group of people and you're like, I'm close, I'm born. It means somewhere in your tribe there was incest. Which is why you guys look the same. It's like pure breed animals. Pure breed dogs. You're like, I can see the type of dog this is. If you can identify that someone looks like Umsutu or Umzulu. That means somewhere there was, there was, I don't know if you call it incest, incest. But they were sleeping with each other within the same geography. Until you guys start looking similar or the same. That's what it is. It's not necessarily that, no, Pilar, when your cheekbones, the cheekbones and the water, it's because of a geography where certain people were sleeping with each other and ended up beginning to look similar. But anyways, the way your features are, um, things like your hair texture, for example, um, the language you speak, Isizulu, for example, which again, it was man-made. You know, Isizulu is a subset of Nguni. Nguni is a subset of... Um, I think the two people, but I think there's a, a gap between Zulu and Du. If you if you do the research, you can find out there's there's history to it. You can you can read up on it. It's not really important. Obviously, we can say there's there's uh, Southern Zulu and Northern Zulu, whatever the case may be. Part of being part of the Zulu nation is diet. What do your people eat? Silupu to Silamas, standing yama yengom. You know, I've heard stories like the Sutus eat horse meat. So that becomes a diet that they have. When we speak about the Asians and eating rice, when we speak about the Indians and curries and spicy foods, you know, when we speak about the Italians and their pastas, for example. So there's a diet that comes with being part of a certain nation. Then there's beliefs. Um, the belief in Amajrozi. Amajrozi being our forefathers that came before us. And it is not a worship of them. It is an acknowledgement of them. It is a communication through them, um, which is meant to align to the higher power being. So when we speak about the God of Abraham, we're now speaking of the God of Africans or the God of Ngunis or the God of Zulus. So Amad Rosi are in effect, when you speak out from a Christian perspective, are our angels. But it's real angels of people that lived before us and who had sex to create who I am today. So when you burn incense, the same way when you smoke weed, the same way when a lady sprays on nice smelly perfume, it invokes certain things within you. And my personal belief is impairable because it's been burnt over generations is a familiar smell to your body because your father smelt it, your grandfather smelt it, your great grandfather smelt it. So when you burn this thing, it's meant to invoke the genetic code that was given to you as a child. But you're speaking through them to be like, hey, whatever the case may be. So Zulu is a nation. And it had a king, the most popular one being Ushaga. The most recent one being Uzulitin. It's a nation. You can leave nations. Which is mind-blowing for a lot of people. 
you can leave a nation. Zulu is not something that is intrinsically within my blood. In the same way, if my great, great, great grandfather, who was Zulu, went to go and fetch a woman from Eswatini or from the Pegis and married her and brought her to Wazulu and had kids with her. And then those kids' descendants led to me. But I've got a great, great grandmother from the Pedi people. Maybe a great grandmother from Mima Koseni. That means my blood has got Pedi blood in it. It has got Kosa blood in it. Me, particularly my maternal grandfather, my father's mother, was, was an Indian Muslim, uh, Chota Amin. So I've got some Indian blood in me. That doesn't mean I'm from India per se. You know, so a nation like being a South African, when white people create borders between South Africa and Zimbabwe, and we're like, you're Zimbabwean, it's a, it's a, it's a fence. It's like the fence between KZN and Pumalang or KZN and the Free State. It's a fence. And you're telling me that once you cross the fence, your blood changes. It doesn't. Your blood is a product merely of the people that had sex to make you. So when you say, yeah, your Zulu blood, it's just the nation I come from. Yeah, your South African blood, it's just the nation I come from. You can leave a nation just as maybe my great-great-grandmother left the baby nation to go and marry a Zulu man. Or my great-grandmother left the Tosa nation. Or my maternal grandfather left India to come and breed with my grandmother. You can leave a nation. I can choose that I don't want to be South African anymore and I want to go and live in Canada. And my children that are born in Canada are going to be Canadian. They're going to be of the Canada nation. Now people are going to be like, yo, so your blood is Canadian. What? My blood is Canadian. America, when Americans are like, I'm an American, I'm an American. You're like, America is a, is a, is a mix of Irish people, the Italians. Obviously, they took a lot of Africans, they're slaves. There's Native Americans there, what we call Red Indians, so to speak. And so many other people there. And you're like, oh, my family's been here for 10 generations. And you're like, okay, so your slave family that's been there for 20 generations, why are you not the same as the white family from Texas that's also been here for 20 generations? You guys are an American nation. So why do you not look the same? Why don't you sound the same? But you're from the same nation. You know, it, it, it's, it's silly when you unpack it, but a lot of people's minds, because of this operating system that is implanted from birth and fully endorsed through the schooling system, through family events, through church, through mainstream media, through social media, you guys literally create this thing and it becomes real in your head. You close your eyes and you imagine what Zulu looks like and it becomes a real thing. Like creating Utigolosho, Amazimzim, you know, creating Casper, the friendly ghost. Uh, the Loch Ness Monster, the Yeti. You guys create these imaginary things and they become real. And then an artist will draw a picture. The guys who make movies will create movies. And all of a sudden, dinosaurs are real because I've seen them. Where did you see a dinosaur? No, man, in Jurassic Park. You're like, a human being created that. But your imagination made it real. Like a lot of your fears are manufactured in your brain and they become real and you have real anxiety and you panic. And you have a panic attack. So when you talk about Zulu as a nation, you've made it real. But it was literally guys who decided to be like, in, within this geography, we will call ourselves the people of the heavens, the people of the sky. And in here, we obviously slept with each other such that we eventually started looking similar. If I go and I live in the Western Cape, where there's Cape Malays and Coloreds, and over five generations, I'm just within the Colored Nation. And I'm sleeping with the woman there and I'm having kids there. And my kids sleep with other coloreds there. Three generations later, it'll just be a colored nation because I've been sleeping with people within the same space. So if my great, great, great grandson who is colored decides, no, I want to leave the coloreds and I want to go and join the Zulus, they'll be like, no, but you've got colored blood. And it's like, you guys are just a nation of people within a space that have had sex with each other. That's why you look the same. But I can leave this and I can go and join someone else. Join the Zulu nation, sleep with people that look sort of the same. And three generations later, all of a sudden, Trevor Noah's got a black Kosa mom and a Swiss father, white man. He's colored, first generation colored. If Trevor has a child with a white woman, his child will look very white. If that child has a child with a white person, all of a sudden it's white. 
And that great, great grandchild will be like, oh, my great, great grandmother is a black Hossa woman. And they'll be like, fuck you, you're lying. And be like, why don't you believe me? Yeah, but you look white. It's just merging, sleeping with people with different skin tones and hair textures. That's all it is. But Zulu is a nation. You can leave the Zulu nation and then leave some of these prescripts. And this is the irony. Almost all of you who claim to be Zulu. I'm using Zulu because that's how I was raised. All of you who grew up Zulu have lost almost every identifier except potentially the language. And here and there visiting the cultural practices. What am I saying? I'm saying when you wake up in the morning and when you sleep at night, 95 to 99% of your life is white English. We were colonized by the British and they enforced their national beliefs and characteristics and whatever. You wake up in the morning and you pray to a Christian God that was brought by these people with their Bible. You no longer pray to Mvilingang in the morning. You don't burn in paper in the morning and connect with Tamajos. No. You wake up and you pray the way you were taught by white missionaries. You believe in a Christian faith. After that, within your home, because architecture is another identifier of culture and nation, you no longer live in a rondavo, in a hut, whether it's mud or made of twigs or whatever. You live in a, a, a European-style home, which is rectangular or square, which has these walls of bricks and cement. You wake up in this Western home, so it's not a Zulu-type home anymore and then you go and shower under nice hot water that white people brought with their electricity you're not showering by the river where the zulus would shower by the river Keza, Mfuleni. you're showering under a nice hot shower and then you wear your nice tie and you wear you're not wearing your traditional zulu dress and your whole day is spent with you speaking english everywhere you go you're typing on social media in English. You're reading articles in English. You're watching English series. You're listening to English music, probably from America. Um, when you get to work, you're speaking English. Here and there, there's Zulu. When you're cracking jokes with your black friend. That's it. Maybe when you call your mom, hey, mama, yeah, hey, hey, unzi, my life, seven. Here and there, it features as a language. But you're largely speaking English. Your children are raised English. That's why a lot of them, especially if you live in the cities, they struggle with the language, your home language of Zulu. Yo, my mom, my mom said my name is Nkantla. Oh, it's so embarrassing. His kid can't speak his Zulu. No, it's because language is just a tool of connection. And you're like, no, you don't understand, Penel. It's a spiritual. You've been bullshitted and you believe it. And you're like, I'm the one that's destroying identity, but you speak English. You dress European. You beg white people for jobs. You study within a Western white schooling system. Your diet comprises of Italian pizza, Italian spaghetti. You know, you're eating poloni and French fries or slob chips from, from the British. Um, if I ask what, what in your diet today was Zulu? Or is it maize meal that you got from a white shop somewhere that was created by white people that farmed white somewhere and you cooked it on a, on a stove? Is it GMO? You know, these processed, genetically modified beef or chicken from KFC. What about your diet today was Zulu? Or even South African, so to speak. But you claim that I'm the one misleading you and I'm the one destroying your identity and I've lost my mind. I haven't. I'm progressing forward. I'm trying to get my people to win. Zulu people and other black African nations in this country were destroyed, defeated, their land taken from them. And more importantly than their land and their livestock, your minds were taken from you. You can choose at any given time to go back. You can be like, you know what? We, you know when we speak about decolonization? Decolonization means removing the, the British aspect of how you live. That means starting by taking off the clothes you wear and dressing like your forefathers dressed. 
It means going to land and working it the way your forefathers worked it and getting the chickens and the cows and the goats on there. It means removing English from your mouth. And ukuluma is zulu paka ne nganza kutina laika as kuluma jizu. Asi kuluma zini zintungoba se decolonized. It means you're not sending your children to these schools. You can't send your child to a school and say, yeah, we're decolonizing the education. Everything about that system is colonial. Everything. You still want to go to church, but you claim to be decolonized. Cognitive dissonance. You have two clashing ideologies. You hate white people, but you like white money. You hate white people, but you want to live or sleep in white hotels. You hate white people, but you want the technology they brought or the technology that's come from Asia. You hate Indians, but you love curry and biryani. You hate foreigners, but foreigners are doing your hair. They're helping you build a back room in your home. You have clashing ideologies because you're lost. And I'm saying, look, you can be lost. It's fine. But then when you bash me for pointing these things out, I'm the bad guy. I'm the Lucifer. I'm the bad guy. It's fine. But like I said, I'm trying to emancipate you from mental slavery. Your mind is going to be lost. Like when Neo comes out in the Matrix, for those of you that have watched the Matrix, when they unplug him and he's in that goo that looks like snotties, he is not free. What he's doing when he gets out of there is he gets plugged into the mind frame of Morpheus. Morpheus then influences his mind that they need to get to Zion and they need to fight Agent Smith and those other guys. So where he was in the Matrix living this life of let's chase money and materialism, he was unplugged into the goo where, where there was a blank canvas again. And then he was plugged into a new way of thinking of this is the real world. And Morpheus said, this is actually our new vision now, fighting the machines and those things. There is no such thing really as an independent, independent mind. And I've spoken before about independence. And when people are saying, you still live at home with your mom, you must be independent. There's no such thing as independence. What they want to do is they want to move you away from your family. They don't want you to live under your family home. They don't want you to work for your parents. They want you to go and live at a separate home so that you're paying a bond or rent to a stranger somewhere or to bank somewhere. They don't want you working for your family. Oh, you're so dependent on your dad. Why do you work for your dad? When are you going to be independent? They want you to go and work for a company for another strange family out there. And they call that independence. No, it's dependence on someone else who is unfortunately not your people. That's why I believe in intentional parenting as penalism. I believe in raising our kids for ourselves and our kids should be an extension of us. If I'm building on something at home, my kids must build on that. We're comfortable to force our kids to go to school, even though they don't want to. But we're not comfortable to force our kids to work for the family business, which is for our and their benefit. We're comfortable forcing and dragging our kids to church, but we're uncomfortable forcing our kids to go and sit with their elders and learn our family history. It's weird. It's so weird. You'll shout at your kids and beat them up for not abiding by the system. A system that enriches and empowers other people. And when, when I tell you, do for your family. Let your kids work for you. Let your, you're like, oh, it's child labor. and it, That's rubbish, man. Your child is forced to sit in school for four or five hours at a desk. Passively taking shit in writing, drawing, cutting up. Why can't they sit in your home and work with you? Do accounting for your business. Sell with you. You're fine with your child playing sports at school, playing rugby and getting stitches and bleeding. But you don't want them working in your factory. You don't want them working on your farm. No, ch children must play. Let the child play in your business. Any of you have ever farmed, there's times when we get to ride horses. There's times when we chase each other. There's fun there. But at least we're adding value to the family. There's nothing wrong with kids being on TV, being presenters on your TV. Hi guys, welcome to Wild Room. My name is that. That's not child labor. But all of a sudden, if I want my kid to work at my hot dog stand, if I want my child to help me pack whatever, that's child labor and I'm wrong and I'm violating laws. Do you realize how your mind has been captured? And it's been captured in such a way that it doesn't help you and your family win. It destroys you and your family. In this economic world we live in of money, your child is kept so far away from money that 12 years of basic education, 4-5 or five years of um, tertiary education, higher learning, and then only after are they now meant to start playing the money game at a negative, 
with debt, with all what, what. Other people's children start early. They start making money at age five. So they start the money game at age five. Whether they're selling t-shirts or they're a cashier at mom and dad's shop or they're helping their parents to do whatever in the home that translates into money. I was speaking about the Zulu nation and the fact that you can leave it and the fact that a lot of you are not Zulu anymore. You're only Zulu in your skin tone, maybe some of your features. You visit the Zulu language every now and then. Um, you visit Zulu customs. All of a sudden, when it suits you, say, say, It's It's frankly disrespectful to your forefathers doing it like that. Because you're shitting on them every day. You're shitting on them every day. And then when it suits you, you visit them. I've always said the 24th of September, what we call Heritage Day, is actually African Halloween. It's where we dress up as our favorite superheroes, like Shaka Zulu with the Makonto and the Beshu and stuff. And it's become so bastardized that you guys don't even really wear your traditional attires. You go to China Mall, you go to Indian shops and you wear these brown pants with a little bit of what you call Zulu pattern. And then you wear Zumkele. You wear Mkele that you got from some pub shop on the side of the road. And you wear these Chinese cheap vests, leopard print. It's so disrespectful and pathetic and disgusting to what you claim to stand for. And those of us who try to keep it 100 are, are bashed. Penalism is about wearing black every day. Not because, well, I do think black is pretty cool, pretty gangster. But because we have to rebrand. And because I'm tired of wearing other people's names on me. Um, Gucci, Prada, Louis Vuitton, Dolce & Gabbana, Sal Salvatore Ferragamo, um, Nike, Adidas, Puma. Adidas and Puma are two brothers from Germany. I'm tired of wearing other people's names. I don't even want to wear Batu and Trip. Those are not my families. That's not building me and my people. Once Theo Baloi and Ulikao, I don't know Likao's surname. Once Theo and Likao become my mates, and I know that I'm in the circle, and I know that when people buy Batu and Trip that I benefit, by all means, I'll promote Batu and Trip because I'll be like, my people are winning. But they're not my mates. And I'm not going to ride on buy black, buy when it's not... Buying from Theo Baloi is not different from me buying a Nike. He just happens to be black. Does he create more jobs for black people than Nike? No. Does he pay more tax at a higher tax rate than the white company? No. Do they even manufacture locally? <laughs> no. So what's unique about him? What's unique is that he's black. That's all. So if a friend of mine owned a Nike store and I knew that in his shop we're creating jobs for our people and I knew that some of the profits he makes, I get to enjoy them. I'll fucking push Nike. I'll constantly tell people, look, Nike is an American brand and we're sending money to America and we're sending jobs to America. But the reason I'm pushing it is because one of my mates is making money from it. We're hoping that the next generation, our kids will copy the Nike um, thingy um, template and then we'll build our own Batu trip. Maybe we'll call it Penwell. Maybe we'll call it Mlojwa. And then that will be our, on our, our, our own thing. And people will go around wearing our names. Oh, come on. You guys are, are, are going around judging and validating each other on, on European people's, American people's names. Families you've never met, you'll never meet, and who do nothing for you, but give you a false sense of validation. Because you refuse to wear passion. You'd rather wear a Louis Vuitton top and think you're... <sighs> So, those who maybe do understand what I'm saying will hopefully understand that Christianity is not serving them and their family. It's serving whatever church they go to. And if you're part of the Roman Catholic Church, it's serving the Vatican City. Your family doesn't manufacture Bibles. Your family doesn't manufacture Amarosari. Your family doesn't own a church. If it does, then cool, push Christianity. Um... I'm trying to build my own tribe, non-racialist, which means we want to be breeding with everyone. We want to have colored kids and white kids and Indian kids and Chinese 
And it's a, how do you know you're a panelist? Because you're not dark. And you're like, yeah, but you know, we're not racialist. So you don't need to be dark. You can do Japan and be a panelist. Because I realize that when you travel the world, a lot of us have similar ideologies. We just happen to come from different backgrounds. We happen to have different private parts. I have a penis, you have a vagina, but everything else we agree. You happen to be light-skinned, white. I happen to be dark-skinned, black. But everything else we kind of agree. You happen to be Nigerian. You happen to be Japanese. You happen to be Spanish. And I'm like, fuck, dog, I agree with you. But you're just not from my nation. And I realized these labels were given for various reasons. You know, and at some point, maybe they served an agenda. But we live in a global world today. We live with technology. Why must we still be stuck in old labels? Why must the head of the family have a penis? If that is not the best qualified person, the strongest person in the family, the best shooter, the best fighter, the most intelligent, the one with the greatest ideas, the, the most successful, the richest, happens to have a vagina. No, but we can't. It's disrespectful to our... To your what? If you can't change those things, and if your leaders and your kings and your presidents can't change those things, change them yourself and your family or create your own thing. And creating your own thing is difficult. I mean, look at me. I'm getting attacked. And it's fine because I'm in good company. All the, the new ideologies get, to, get attacked. Jesus Christ was crucified. So I'm, I'm in good company. I'm getting crucified. Luckily, it's not in physically. You know, I'm getting crucified on the internet. Boo-hoo. People would compare Donald Trump to Adolf Hitler and Robert Mugabe. And I was like, Donald Trump didn't kill anyone. Just because he says certain words. Now you want to... Those guys killed. Real life. Sil Ramaphosa at Marikana. Killed. Real life. ANC, life is demanding. Killed. Real life. Donald Trump created jobs for black people in America. Created jobs for legal Mexicans in America. That's the bad guy. That's the old Donald Trump. Hey, hey, Hitler. <laughs> You guys are so stupid and the media and propaganda machines work overtime to get you guys to buy into this shit. No one has died from COVID lately in South Africa. whoop de doo But we're still not vaccinated. So how? How, Sway? No, no, no. It's because the, the Omicron variant was much milder than the Delta variant. Oh, so, oh, okay. So the variants, what makes the variants? No, it's, it's science. Science is as much bullshit as religion. It's a story. It's a story that you buy into. You no, know, Corona stands for crown viruses. You know, they, they, they come from... That's a story. I spoke about Jesus Christ earlier and I learned to love the Bible because I had huge beef with the Bible after reading it. There's, there's a part in the Bible, I forget the characters' names, but these, these daughters get their father drunk so that they can sleep with him, so that they can have children. <laughs> uh, Noah, Noah's children on the, on the ark who are they sleeping with to build a new nation Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel who, who are they all sleeping with to <laughs> I apologize to the Christians man fuck me but uh one of the greatest movies, I think, to date, it's my favorite movie. The Avengers Infinity War, Marvel Studios. Thanos. Thanos. Jeez. Uh, forgot this guy's name, man. James Brolin. Josh Brolin. Josh Brolin is a brilliant actor. And his presence and his voice. You will know now what it feels like to lose. Okay, I can't do the voice, but yeah, he's... Yeah, fuck. So Thanos in the movie Infinity War at some point to get the soul stone. There's these stones that he has to get to unlock all these powers. To get the soul stone, he needs to sacrifice something he loves the most. And what he loves the most is his adopted daughter Gamora. Which obviously is the story of God sacrificing his only begotten son, Jesus. Um... A lot of movies obviously have been inspired by Bible, by religion. You know, a lot of the stories, I mean, not just the Bible, but if you look at all the way back, because the Bible in itself steals a lot from other older beliefs, Greek, Roman mythology. I mean, if you look at the examples of Hercules, Achilles, Jesus, all three of them are half man, half God. 
You know, there's a whole host of other, if you look at the similarities, not really important it's for people that are interested in this stuff. Thanos really inspired me and I was like, if I could have the focus of Thanos in whatever it is I'm trying to achieve in the world, I think I'll succeed. Unflinching, unwavering focus in achieving the outcomes and building an army and doing whatever it takes. And I was like, if I could be so inspired by a fictional story, what's wrong with being inspired by the Bible and just seeing it as a fictional story? The Bible is what some of the coolest stories you'll ever read. The story of Samson and Delilah. The story of David and Goliath. The story of Noah, a guy who had a vision and heard a voice that only he could hear. And he said, guys, bad times are coming. Please join me. And everyone laughed at him. Penwell said, guys, join Penwellism. Penwellism is the answer. And everyone laughed at him. And when shit fucked out, Penwell and his people of Penwellists survived the floods. Survived the COVID jabs. Whatever you want to call it in metaphoric terms. Because he saw something that other people couldn't see. And other people were like, I think I hear what you're saying. I think I want to be part of your insanity. One of the cool things that I did when I looked at the definitions, because people are calling me a narcissist, I'm egotistical, I'm mentally ill. I'm like, most of your leaders have the same exact mental illnesses. Jesus Christ being one of the greatest examples. I'm God's son. What? My mom is a virgin. That guy was a huge narcissist. Hugely egotistical. Went and he debated and, and argued with some of the greatest beliefs of the time. And today, the crazy people who decided to be his disciples and who decided to spread his gospel have built a huge, a huge religion called Christianity. And somewhere along the way, they spread it through violence. The Christian crusades. The Islamic faith have also had their own Crusades where they went around killing people and enforcing Islam and colonizing certain parts and enforcing Islam. These are the beliefs that you guys worship today. My God is loving and forgiving. Your God has got so much blood on his hands. I've got no blood on my hands, but I'm the bad guy because I'm challenging your, your thinking and the operating system that's been implanted in your brain. I'll take it. I'll take it because I want the world to be better and I want us to move into the future. I want us to have something modern that makes sense to me and you and people like us because I want us to win and to stop enriching other families and other nations and being bullied and dominated and killed by other nations. I want us to have the, the best and biggest weapons. I want us to colonize the world with penalism. I want us to spread love and peace and growing our own food and being healthy. That's what I want and it's my vision and it's fine even if it's just me alone. If my own children are like, oh, my dad's fucking crazy. Mom tells me all the time. Dad has got this weird cult thing called penalism and he talks this rubbish and he wears black all day and it's just, it's weird, bro. But fuck, you can't choose your family, right? But yeah, oh, my dad. And I'll know that they've been influenced by their moms, by the outside world and it's fine. But if ever any of my kids are like, I think I hear this crazy fucking bastard do fucking gave birth to me. We must start wearing colorful clothing when we manufacture it ourselves. For now, let's be black and plain and be chimpanzees and build for ourselves and win. My dad speaks about healthy living. So if I do push-ups and squats and exercise, does that mean I'm being a penalist? You know, if I'm working with my community and building and I'm bartering, does that mean I'm a penalist? If I'm a minimalist and I don't want a lot of access and I'm not into materialism, does that mean I'm a penalist? No, fuck. I'm going to eat food and be fat and be useless. And I'm going to collect all the material stuff and I'm going to wear all the big brands in the world. Fuck penalism. I'm going to rebel. And you're going to enrich other nations that have been built on similar principles but for themselves. This video has been too long. I think I'll speak about penal penalism um, later but yeah that's how i left the zulu nation that's how i left christianity because it's also just a belief system that you can leave a lot of you are woke today so luckily you understand the idea of leaving christianity it's not like you're but spiritual but you've got christian in your blood your great grandmother was a christian how can you leave christianity <laughs> like christianity is just a belief system with a set of rules the zulu nation is a nation with a set of rules and beliefs you can leave them and join another one or you can create your own mind-blowing what 
It's not. It's the most simplest thing on the planet. You just unfortunately have never had the operating system, the software, the apps in your mind challenged. And I'm here to challenge them because I want you to win. Because I genuinely love you. Love you guys. Have a great day.